So that's what focus stacking is visually, like in the final product. Now let's talk a bit about what it is technically. Perhaps more important or most important to understand is that focus stacking is a form of sampling. Just like we like music CDs and movie DVDs. Focus stacking is digital, so it's a form of digital sampling. By the very definition of the word sampling, it means that we have here what we have is a sample and not the entire thing. With music CDs, digital samples are taken at intervals close enough together that our ear cannot tell the difference. And it's the same with the various uh, movie codecs. They are samples taken often enough that our eye does not know what it cannot see. Now the same is true for focus stacking. We are, we are sampling focus from a series of focused layers. And then we're combining those layers into a single photo that displays the sample focus stacking as a relatively flawless result. By relatively flawless, I'm referring to the fact that the smoothness of the resulting stacked photo can depend on the number of layers that were sampled. For instance, with music CDs or movie DVDs, we have industry standards for sampling. Standards that guarantee the results are beneath the threshold of our eyes and ears. But with focus stacking, we have no standards. We can stack from two layers of photos on up to a thousand or more layers. It's all up to us. And the results can be smooth or they can be lumpy. So that's the first point. That, we have, that what we have here is another form of digital sampling. A second point is that in any form of sampling, we have what are called artifacts, which are unwanted digital noise that appears in the photos. Again, that's what industry standards are supposed to prevent, but here we have no standards. And this is where the skill of the photographer and the software used to stack the photos comes in. Focus stacking is something, at least currently, that we learn how to do. And that learning curve can be a little steep, meaning that your stack photos may not come out as you, as you want them or, or quite as nicely as you had imagined. I'll have a lot more to say on artifacts later in this tutorial, but there's just one, one more general point I want to bring up, and that is the whole idea of impressionism. Focus stacking is a form of impressionism. I mean, this is where the art of focus stacking comes in. Sampling, by its very nature, is, is impressionistic, since the whole enchilada is not being presented, but rather just samples of it. And focus stacking can be sampled in a variety of ways, in different ways, with different results. In reality, all photography is a form of impressionism, but focus stacking is even more so. As those of you who choose to learn this technique, you're going to find out that focus stacking really is a fine art. Now let's look at what's involved in stacking focus, both as regards your time, but also what equipment you're going to need. Stacking is time consuming, and we're going to get back to that later in, the, in this tutorial. But for now, let's look at what kind of equipment you're going to need. Obviously, you need a camera. It's almost a cliche by now that in photography, the camera that you have is the camera to use. Now, I hear, I hear that clearly, but I'm not going to echo it. Sure, play around with the camera you have. I, I, I understand that. And I, I don't want to discourage anyone from trying this technique. But with focus stacking, to do it properly, I mean to get good results, you have to have at minimum certain basic equipment. So I'm not going to beat around the bush about this. Instead, I'll just kind of lay it out there and let you consider whether you want to ante up for the equipment. Many of you may already have what you need. And I'm not going to list just the bare minim minimum because it just doesn't work. But rather, I'm going to tell you what you actually need to be successful and what you will probably end up buying anyway should you like this technique. 
And instead of naming specific camera models and so on right off, let's instead look at what features, in my opinion, are at minimum what you need to stack focus. So what you're going to get here is the short list of proper equipment. Of course, you're going to need a DSLR that has the following features, and we're going to go over the features one at a time in a minute, but here are the features just as a list. The camera should have interchangeable lenses. It should have a mirror up option. It should have a depth of field preview button. It should be 12 megapixels or higher sensor. It should be able to focus in manual mode. It should have a remote shutter release. It should have a histogram screen, very important, a bright viewfinder, and the capacity to process raw images. That's point one. Second point, you need a sturdy tripod. Third, you need a good head, a good ball head. Four, you need what's called an L bracket. And five, you need good lenses. Now I'm going to go through the same material in a little more detail, uh, starting with the features that we need on a DSLR. We'll start with what's called mirror up. When we look through the viewfinder of one of the better DSLRs, we are looking through a prism at the viewfinder level that reflects the subject image from a mirror lower down at the level of the lens itself. That mirror stands directly in front of the sensor, the same place that film used to be in the old days, the sensor. In order to take a photo, the mirror has to be moved out of the way physically and at lightning speed. DSLR cameras do this, but when the mirror is raised, which is called mirror up, it can't help but slap the top of the camera as it hits it, and it sends a vibration resonating through the camera body and even the tripod. I can feel it. For most ph photography work, this vibration is not a big problem. But for very exact work with longer shutter times or a longer lens in macro mode, it takes time for that vibration, the, the vibration that's generated by the mirror slap to die down, to dissipate. This is why the better DSLR cameras have what, what is called a mirror up feature. It allows you to press your shutter button once and the mirror slaps up and resonates, dies out, but it doesn't take the photo. It's only when you press the button a second time after waiting for that vibration to die down that actually the photo gets taken. So it's a two-step process. Not all cameras have this, but if you are a macro shooter, you need to have it. I use it for every photo I take uh, in stacking. Close-up macro and especially focus stacking techniques require that the camera not vibrate or shake. The large DSLRs from Canon and Nikon all have to get the mirror out of the way of the viewfinder when a photo is taken. And that slap of the mirror slamming up is enough to cause vibrations that affect the quality of the photo visibly, especially at long shutter speeds. You can feel the, bra you can feel the vibration if you touch the pad of a finger to the tripod and press the mirror up button with the other hand. It's a very real factor, so look for this feature. Anyway, this is why most high-end camera bodies have, have it, the mirror up mode, because it allows you to click the shutter twice, once to move the mirror up and out of the way, and a second time to actually take the photo, after which the mirror, of course, slaps back down, but too late to affect the photo by causing vibrations. You already took that with the second press. Anyway, the bottom line is that you want to get a camera body that allows you to park the mirror up and out of the way before each shot. If your camera does not have this feature, you are at, you are at a real disadvantage. So look for this feature before you buy the camera. 
Now let's talk about interchangeable lenses. We're going to get to lenses big time, not long from now. But for close-up and macro work, you're going to need a variety of lenses depending on the work that you want to do and the subjects involved. Although I most often use a macro lens, some scenes call for a wide-angle lens that has very near focus and others for a telephoto or just a standard 50 millimeter lens. If your camera has one single fixed lens, that means you can't remove it, you are stuck with that. And most fixed lenses do not have a macro mode, or if they do, it's not really very good, not good enough for what we're talking about. And while a fixed lens may work, they do not give you enough flexibility for the best work and very, very few lenses, as I mentioned earlier, have really decent close-up abilities. Anyway, you want to get a camera that you can take the lens off of. You can interchange lenses. Now, the sad part is that Canon and Nikon, the two largest uh, camera companies, their lenses are not interchangeable with one another. I mean, how stupid is that? So this is why we have Canon users on one side and the Nikon users on the other. Um, I'm a Nikon user and I love them, but uh, I know the Canons do a great job too. Do not, so don't assume that if your camera has a macro mode, this will do it. That's just crazy. It just won't work. Now let's talk about a little more complicated, the depth of field. Depth of field preview button. Not all cameras have them. Lenses, every lens has a diaphragm that opens and closes, letting light in a lot or not. And it can be set to, they can be set wide open, you know, it lets in the most light, all the way down to its minimum aperture, it lets in the least light. Now when it's wide open, the lens allows a lot of light to fill the viewfinder, and you can actually see your subjects. But as you close the diaphragm down to higher, smaller apertures, there is less and less light to see with in the viewfinder. This is why most lenses automatically allow the camera to open wide to focus. In the, you know, so you can see in the viewfinder, then when you press the shutter button to take the picture, it automatically closes the diaphragm down to the correct exposure at the moment the photo was taken. And this is all invisible to you as a user. But it allows us to see through the viewfinder and to get the most light to focus by. So anyway, all of this is well and good until you, get to, until you get to the point where you want to have some idea of how much depth of field you have actually gained by stopping a given lens down to a higher, you know, a narrow aperture. Well, you can't do that because, as I mentioned above, the camera automatically sets the lens wide open when you look through the viewfinder. This is why some of the better cameras have what's called a depth of field preview button, so that when you press the button, it sets the lens to the actual aperture you have chosen so that you can see exactly the depth of field you're going to be getting in that photo. The problem with that is that if, if it's a narrow aperture, it can be very, very dark, and you can't even see what you, you can't even see to focus with it, which is why you want to focus with, you know, at the widest aperture the lens has. Anyway, when you look through the depth of field preview at high, you know, less light apertures, the view can be very dark. And the bottom line here is to find a camera that has a depth of field preview button. It's very useful. You can really survive without it, kind of, uh, but I would not buy a camera without it. It's not essential for beginners, but it is for experienced users. So if you ever get past the beginning, you're going to kick yourself for not having it. And I hope that tells you something. Now, re remote shutter release. This is a must-have feature for close-up and macro shooting. You can't be putting your finger on the camera and pressing the shutter and not get an effect on, you know, on these very, very detailed close-up photos. Uh, so the camera has to have the, the camera body has to have the ability to take a remote cord or trigger, or at least some way to trigger the shutter remotely. We need that. So whatever you do, don't. Uh, purchase a camera for close-up or macro work without it. Most decent cameras have this. Some have an actual cord that plugs into a socket on the camera. 
that allows you to fire the shutter without touching the camera and tripod. Some of the newer, usually smaller cameras have a tiny battery operated remote that will trigger the shutter. So you can um, stand, stand away from the camera and fire the shutter, but make sure if you have an electronic remote that it will work when you're standing behind the camera. Some of them just work when you're out in front of the camera, like in a group, so to get a group photo. Then you find out later that, gee, if you're behind the camera where we're going to be stacking photos, it won't work. And the remote also allows us to put the mirror up with first press, take a photo with the second press, and so forth. As far as remotes, I can't imagine doing stack photos without a remote of some type. You don't want to be touching the camera when you're shooting a 30-shot image. You know, um, adjusting the lens or the rack is, is bad enough, but you know the vibrations from actually touching the camera, it just ruins photos. Now let's talk about megapixels uh, briefly. How many do you need? I'm just going to give you my opinion. Obviously, you can do whatever you've got, but having had these digital cameras from the very beginning of Nikon all the way up to now, it's my opinion that you, opinion that you want at least 12 megapixels and perhaps more. Ideally, 16 to 18 megapixels sensors would be ideal. Anything smaller than that, and I can really feel the pinch. I guess I believe that 18 megapixels would be perfect for my work. But 16 megapixels will do, and even 12 megapixels works. But I no longer feel that 6 megapixels is enough, so please avoid those for your sake. Anything larger than 18 megapixels is going to slow down my software when stacking photos. But the result of increased megapixels is well worth the trouble. But I go back and forth. Uh, sometimes, out of sheer laziness, I stack with less megapixels than I could. Um, but today, just you know, the truth is, I regu I, my regular stacking is now at 36 megapixels, which is be, you know, we're talking about when stacking 200 megabyte files times the number of layers of files. So I just have to wait, but the wait, it's worth the wait. Also, you might ask yourself, how large a file do you need to publish if, if all you're doing is putting it on the web? I never print out photos. I don't have any photos on my wall. I just don't, you know, this, I can explain this later, but in a brief explanation, is the resulting photos is not what interests me. What interests me is the process of photographing and the state of mind that it puts me in. And I'm never at the point where I think I have finished a photo that I want to put on the wall. It's always like out there in the future. Anyway, for web photos, you seldom need more than 10, 24 pixels on the long side. So huge files don't get you much unless you are doing panel or billboard size photos. That being said, I find that very large sensors and their very large files make much better photos when they are downsized for web display. So there you are. <laughs>